people want to um, make something mystical or mysterious about how to hear the voice of God, but ultimately hearing the voice of God is 80, 90% of it is right here. That's the voice of God speaking to you. So you've got to be in the Word and, uh, and you've got to be led by the Spirit, but the Spirit of God will always use the Word of God. That's why when you don't put the Word in people and when you don't put the Word in your life and you want to be led by the Spirit, you're going to get very flaky. There's a lot of people out there that just want to, you know, they claim they're being led by the Spirit, but, but there's, there's no Word. There's no Word to base what they're doing or what they're believing, and that's, that's very, very flaky. But go with me to Romans chapter 8, verse 12. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. And that's what I was talking about, wisdom. That's flesh. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. So how do you actually... It's not about, well, I'm not going to walk in the flesh... And, and you can't put the flesh under with the flesh, which is what religion tries to do. Rules, regulations, and systems, and methods. But it's really the life in the spirit is how you actually put the flesh to death. So you live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. One thing you need to understand, the Bible tells us that we're children of God. Those who have believed in Him have become children of God. That word for children or child is the word technon, which literally means a little one. Like somebody in nursery or bear, river bears, you know, three to, three to five, little children, kids church. But then... Sons of God are different. It's a different Greek word. The Greek word is H-U-I-S. It's pronounced huis, which means adult, really. A son or an adult or someone that's mature. So, you know, it's one thing to be a child, but it's another thing to become an adult. So, the process of spiritual growth leads you to being a son of God and those that are led by the Spirit of God, they're the sons of God. You know, little children, you know how little children are. The Bible even says foolishness is bound in the heart of the child, which is their flesh, but the rod of correction drives it from them. So you have to discipline little children because you can't leave them to themselves, can you? You can't just leave them to their own. You don't leave little children in the kitchen. Hey, Johnny, little Johnny, five-year-old, go in there, you know, cook something for yourself. Grab some knives, grab some pots and pans. I mean, it's going to be a mess. They're not equipped to handle that kind of stuff. You don't take little children and you give them loaded guns. You know, there are certain things children cannot handle. Because so when the Bible talks about the foolishness of a child, it's talking about the flesh of a child. It's the parent's responsibility to discipline little children and not to allow their flesh to do whatever. But now you, you know, you have people that just let their children and kids do whatever they and they think it's cute and they think it's, you know, wrong if you discipline them and whatever. Um, and that's why we have the generation we have, which is they've never been disciplined. And so a son of God is someone that's been disciplined and discipled. Someone that has been grounded in the word and learned how to walk in the spirit. Because as many as are led by the sons of God are, or by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. So our aiming in the Christian walk is to become spiritual, which means to be, learn how to be led by the Spirit. As many as are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. Those are the people that show spiritual maturity. Carnal Christians don't display spiritual maturity. They get offended over every little thing. They get fretful. They get restless. They're disobedient. Right? They just do foolish things. But a mature believer 
is a believer that's committed to walking in the Spirit. Amen. Amen. And being led by the Spirit. And I'm not saying, you know, and it, it's a level of maturity that you have to aim at and attain. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage, verse 15, again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by which, by whom you cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. So notice it goes from sons of God to children of God. This is the word child. As soon as you're born again, you're a child of God. The Spirit of God lives on the inside of you and witnesses to your spirit. That's the number one way you hear God's voice. It's not some mystical, mysterious thing. A lot of people are expecting that God's going to come. There's going to be a loud trumpet sound and angel's going to come and announce, God is about to speak to you. And, and people are expecting some kind of spectacular thing and they're missing the spiritual thing which is the inner witness of the Spirit of God, right? Why? Because if we are children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified with him. So the number one way God's going to speak to you will be the inner witness of the Spirit. The Spirit of God will witness to your spirit. Amplify says testifies to your spirit. So the inner witness inner witness them that are led by the spirit of god are the sons of god and they follow the inner witness they follow the inner witness you don't have to become a mature believer to be able to follow the inner witness any child of god the moment you're born again you have the witness of the spirit on the inside of you the spirit of god will witness to you how does the witness work I'm glad you asked. I'm going to give you two more passages. Then go with me to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5 verse 16. But I say then walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, or resists is another word, or strives against another word, and the spirit against the flesh. These are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. So the flesh, the desires of the flesh is always going to be opposite the desires of the spirit. They're going to be contrary. They're going to be going in opposite directions. So if you follow the flesh, you're going to go in the opposite direction of the will of God. They're not just a little off by a degree or two or three degrees. They're completely in the opposite direction. They're off by 180 degrees. Amen. But if you're led by the Spirit, you see that right there, being led by the Spirit. Didn't we just see that? Them that are led by the Spirit are what? Sons of God. But if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. What does that mean? You don't need rules and regulations and methods. You have, to be, you have to learn to be led by the Spirit. Okay? So, them that are led by the Spirit are, the, are sons of God. And if you're led by the Spirit, then go to Colossians chapter 3, verse 15. This is a very important verse of scripture. This is actually to do with the witness. Let the peace of God rule or govern or witness in your hearts to which you're, you were also called in one body and one um, and be thankful. Look at what the Amplified says. Let the peace, soul harmony which comes from Christ rule, act as an umpire continually in your hearts, deciding and settling with finality all questions that arise in your minds in that peaceful state to which as members of Christ, one body you were also called to live and be thankful, appreciative, giving praise to God always. So 
Notice, let the peace of God rule or govern or be the umpire or lead you is another way. So the number one way God leads you is the inner witness, which is the peace of God. And the best way I can explain is like a green light or a red light. A go or a stop. A permission or a prohibition. God will either permit you or prohibit you. He'll either say yes or he'll say no. He'll either light a green light or he'll, he'll light a red light. He'll either release a peace or there'll be a lack of peace. But it's in your heart. It's not an emotion. That's why you can never make important decisions when you're emotional. It'll always be the wrong one because the flesh and emotions will get involved. You have to let the emotions settle. That's why you should never make a decision under stress or under pressure or under the gun. You have to let things settle. When you get all stirred up, how many of you you've got, you've got stirred up emotionally? You have to let things settle. And then you have to go sleep on it a day or two or three maybe, but you have to pray on it and you have to pray in tongues and you have to get in the word and you have to settle down because it says, let the peace of God settle with finality, all questions. So many of the times you'll have some questions. I think when I got started in the ministry, I had all the answers. Now I have more questions than answers. How many of you know what I'm talking about? As you get older in life, you have more questions than answers. Your teenager, they have all the answers, don't they? They know everything. They know everything. But when you have questions, you have to ask God. I don't think people ask God enough questions. I think they're trying to tell God the answers in prayer. God, I know the answer already, so this is what I'm telling you. Please do this. And God's like, no. Nope. You need to ask God. You need to ask God questions. You need to ask God and let him give you the answers. And the way he's going to give you the answer will be either a peace, because most of the time you kind of leaning in a direction anyways. And the Lord's going to either pull you back and say no, or he's going to say yes. Go through it. Go ahead with it. So you have to let the peace of God be the umpire. Now, I'm going to give you five ways for the peace of God to rule in your hearts. Because the peace of God or the being led by the Spirit, as the Spirit of God leads you, you're going to do one of five things, or you might do two or three or four, or maybe all five of these things. If you do these things, it's going to hinder you being led by the Spirit of God. A lot of times, I think it's easier for me to give people the things that are going to mess it up than give people the, the things that will not. Because number one, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30 and 31 tells you not to grieve the Spirit of God. One of the key ways that people lose their peace is because they've grieved the Spirit of God. If you have grieved the Spirit of God, you're going to know it. You'll be grieving the Spirit of God. You'll be grieving the Holy Ghost on, on the inside of you. If the Spirit of God is grieved... That is a sign to you that you're out of order. Because you can't have the Spirit of, God, Spirit of God grieved in you at the same time as having peace. Many Christians grieve the Spirit of God. They grieve the Spirit of God. And they break the seal. Look at what it says. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. 
Look at this. It tells you what grieves the Spirit of God. My hermeneutic students, let the Bible what? Interpret itself. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. These are the things that will grieve the Spirit of God. These are the key things that you see very commonly practiced by believers that grieve the Spirit of God. Offenses. Offenses. Bitterness, resentment, offense, unforgiveness, indignation, wrath, rage, bad temper, and resentment. Anger, animosity, and quarreling, strife, arguing, brawling, clamor, contention, slander. E what is evil speaking? Criticism, judgment, gossip. One of the biggest sins in the church that goes unaddressed is gossip. People run their mouth, talk, talk, talk. Evil speaking. It says, it, let it be banished from you. And with all malice, which is spite, ill will, or baseness of any kind. That means when people get offended, they do things that are bad. So you have to protect your heart and not grieve the Spirit of God. Because when you grieve the Spirit of God, you can't be led by the Spirit of God. That's why when people don't protect their hearts, they... The enemy leads them right out of the will of God. They make terrible decisions. They're doing great. All of a sudden, boom, over a week, two, three, and it's like, what in the world happened to that person? They got offended. They didn't protect their heart. They allowed resentment, bitterness. They allowed somebody to come and spew poison. They got involved in gossip, criticism, judgment. And their heart got tainted. And now their heart that's corrupted, you can't be trusted. That heart cannot be trusted to lead them. Because the Holy Spirit of God has been grieved and the seal has been broken. By whom you were sealed, marked, branded by God's own, secured. Amen. What happens when the seal is broken? They become contaminated or corrupted. When you go to the grocery store, right? You, you see bottles, you see containers, they're sealed. Boxes, everything's sealed, right? If the seal is broken, would you buy it? No. Why? Because that's a sign to you. It's contaminated or corrupted. And guess what happens if you eat contaminated food? You get poisoning, food poisoning. Why are so many people poisoned? Seal has been broken. And they've eaten something that's corrupted or contaminated. They've participated in gossip or slander or criticism or judgment. Offenses and resentment and bitterness. These are the, because you have to let the Bible interpret itself. Verses 31, 30 and 31 are tied these are the, the biggest ways how the Spirit of God gets grieved. And then verse 32 says, be kind to one another. Become useful, helpful, kind to one another. Tender-hearted, compassionate, understanding, loving-hearted. Forgiving one another readily and freely as, in God, as God in Christ forgave you. So forgiveness, being kind-hearted, protecting your heart. Compassion, understanding, these are important things. We are living in a time where the real epidemic is offense. A real pandemic, maybe. There's a pandemic of offense going on. It's terrible. I've never seen people get so offended. I've been doing this a while. It seems to me, looking back on 20 years ago, it wasn't this bad. 10 years ago, it wasn't this bad. It's getting worse. Why? Because the Bible warns about the signs of the end times. 
that love of many will grow cold for the tribulation or the trouble of the last days. People will even betray one another. Brothers will betray brothers. Offense leads to, leads to betrayal and to deception. These, there are significant warnings. That's why it's vital that you protect your heart because the moment you lose your peace, you lose your direction. If the Spirit of God is grieved because of these things, you can't be led by the Spirit of God because you, you, it's not that the Spirit of God is not trying to lead you. You just, you'll be misled. You won't be able to pick up on the leading of the Spirit because the first thing the Spirit of God is going to lead you will be to repent and to forgive. And if you refuse to do that, then he can't lead you any further than your last place of obedience. There's people who've been crying out to God, God, give me a word for 10 years. And God's like, uh, the same word you got 10 years ago, you haven't done it. They want a new word, but they haven't done the word from 10 years ago. Why should God give you? An God is very patient. He'll sit there and sit on the same word for 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. He sat on the same word with Moses for 40 years. Moses was in the wilderness in a place of disobedience for 40 years. 40 years later, he gets, guess what? The same word. I've called you to deliver my people, which is what I told you 40 years ago, but will you try to do it in the flesh? Are you ready now to do it in the spirit? Uh, yes, sir. 40 years later, same thing. God didn't change his mind. The gifts and callings of God are without repentance. God doesn't change his mind. He's waiting on you. God doesn't repent. We have to repent. Pastor, how do I get things right in my life? Repent. The art of repentance is still the same thing. Repent means change. Turn around. Okay? So, I think the number one Hindrance to being led by the Spirit is grieving the Spirit of God. The number two is quenching the fire. When you lose your fire, and, and, and I watched a lot of believers that were on fire lose the fire. And, and now they're led right out of the, the will of God because, because now they're lukewarm. You have to stay on fire. You can't. Quench the fire. First Thessalonians 5.19 instructs us, do not quench the Spirit. Do not quench, suppress, or subdue the Holy Spirit. When people lose their fire, all of a sudden they start to make decisions that are compromised. Why do you think we, we so, so strongly encourage, admonish, and exhort people to be on fire. Many of you, you can look back on your journey. You've been touched by the fire of God and revival. And there are many others at the same time. Where are they now? Now they're living a compromised life because they're no longer on fire. They've lost the fire. They've quenched the spirit. They've lost their fire. They become lukewarm. Amen. Amen. That's why it's vital that you never quench the spirit. Suppress or subdue the fire because when you, what leads people to become lukewarm is because they've quenched the fire. And the same attitude that quenches the fire is the same attitude that will be, begin to suppress or subdue the work of the Holy Spirit in their life. Yeah, we used to do that. We used to do that revival thing. But we've grown out of it now. we become a little bit more administrative. What are you talking about? Yeah, we don't do that anymore. We've kind of gone in a different direction. I've had churches tell me that. Churches I used to go to revival. Pastors that I used to know. I've been around revival since 97. And I've seen a lot of, especially being around Dr. Rodney, Revival Ministries International. I've seen hundreds, literally thousands of people come and go. If you want to be led by the Spirit, you got to be on fire. You can't lose your fire. You lose your fire, you lose your direction. The third hindrance to being led by the Spirit 
is resisting the Holy Spirit. Resisting the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 7. Talking about the five hindrances that keep Christians from walking in the Spirit, being led by the Spirit. Acts chapter 7, verse 51. You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do you. Now, this is, of course, is an extreme case of a very, very religious, stiff-necked, hard-hearted people. They have developed a lifestyle, a habit of resisting the Holy Spirit. I mean, they're so hard-hearted. He's speaking to the religious people of the time. But look at this, what it says. You stubborn and stiff-necked people, still heathen and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you're always actively resisting the Holy Spirit. You got to be careful that you don't develop a lifestyle of resisting the Holy Spirit. So you can resist the Holy Spirit once, but if you do twice, three times, four times, five, and you keep resisting the Holy Spirit, now your heart will become hardened. Every time the Holy Spirit speaks or leads and you resist, every time you resist, you harden your heart a little bit more. And you can literally go from being a born-again Christian who's had the stony heart removed and a heart of flesh put in and over time you can keep resisting and resisting and resisting and then you end up developing the hardness of heart you can end up having a hard my bible calls it a hard hard heart of unbelief because what is unbelief continually resisting the voice of god and the word of god right so number one way that Christians are hindered from being led by the Spirit is grieving the Holy Spirit. Number two is quenching the fire. Number three is resisting the Holy Spirit. You don't want to resist the Holy Spirit. When He speaks to you, you don't want to resist. You want to obey. Because I'm going to tell you, He's going to keep telling you the same thing over and over and over again. He's not going to change His mind just because you don't like it. But guess what? Every time He continues to speak, the voice will become dimmer and dimmer and dimmer and that strong voice will become, will begin to fade away to the point where, because like, you know, you're getting further and further away, right? When you're close, hello, but when you're, right, 200 yards away, that hello is not as strong. When you're 500 yards away, you can barely hear the hello because you're getting further and further from the will of God and the voice becomes dimmer and dimmer and begins to fade out and then to the point where now you're a mile away, you can't even hear me say hello. I can shout from the top of my lungs, you're not gonna hear me from a mile away. Do you understand that? So you don't wanna resist the Holy Spirit, you wanna be obedient quickly, 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 quickly. And I watched Christians, I've told them the same thing, year after year after, after four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years, the same thing. And the condition gets worse because there's no longer grace. Where God gave him grace four, five, six years ago, he will no longer give them the grace. And maybe they got away with it and God was patient with them. But after a while, the grace isn't there. You have to understand this. You have to understand the ways of God. You don't play with these things. Don't be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever you sow, you reap. The number four way Christians are not led by the Spirit of God. Do you see a progression? You go from grieving to quenching to resisting to eventually lying to the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 5 verse 3. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? Now, it's interesting, right? Can you actually lie to the Holy Spirit? He knows everything, right? 
I think you're actually lying to yourself. And keep back part of the price of the land for yourself. It says, Amplified, should in violation of your promise withdraw secretly and appropriate to your own use part of the price from the sale of the land. Basically, doing something in secrecy, thinking that you can actually lie to the Holy Spirit, but you can't. As if God doesn't see it, right? Whatever is in secret, He sees. And so you can come to the point where now you're doing things in secret and so being, become so self-deceived thinking that God doesn't see it. Right? So you go from grieving the Holy Spirit to quenching the fire to resisting the Holy Spirit to ultimately lying to the Holy Spirit. You become so self-deceived that you think God can't see it or, do, or, or there's no consequences anymore. That's when Ananias and fell over dead. I mean, that's a pretty bad place. And the final stage, number five way that people, Christians, hinder being led by the Spirit is blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Blaspheming the Holy Spirit, and which Jesus calls the unpardonable sin. What is blaspheming the Holy Spirit? Saying that what the Spirit of God is doing is actually of the devil. Or not allowing the work of the Holy Spirit to the point where the devil comes in. Remember Judas, Bible says Satan entered his heart and then he went and betrayed Jesus. It didn't happen overnight, you know that. He had been stealing the money for quite a while and he thought he could lie to the Holy Spirit. See, he went from grieving the Holy Spirit to quenching the fire, right? To resisting the Holy Spirit and to the point where what? He ended up lying to the Holy Spirit and then he ended up blaspheming the Holy Spirit and he paid a high price. And this is somebody who walked with Jesus and was a part of his inner circle of ministry team. Think about that. So you don't want to be in that progression. So you want to keep your heart tender. Be tender hearted. Always forgiving. Never allowing bitterness. Malice. Resentment. Unforgiveness to develop in your heart. Because which is what grieves the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit's grieved for a period of time. You'll begin to lose the fire. When you begin to lose the fire. You begin to now resist the very people that were in revival actually now resist revival. I've seen it happen. We have a staff member that used to be on our staff in Istanbul, Turkey. They moved to the United States and I said, now they said everything, and this was a graduate of the River Bible Institute in Istanbul, they said, Everything I learned in the River Bible Institute, I repent from. I reject it now. But it didn't happen overnight. They got around with the wrong people. They were poisoned. They turned against Pastor Gobble, started to speak against him, started speaking against me. And now they're saying that we don't even know. I never knew the man. I never knew the river, you know. Now they're sitting in a very religious place and they're just so deceived. It breaks my heart. And these were people that once had the fire of God. And now they have nothing. Nothing. When you do this long enough, you watch stuff like this happen. I've seen it all. You don't want to... And, and then you go from grieving to quenching to resisting to now lying to now blaspheme. Oh, that joy, that wasn't of God. And you spent hours on the floor. That tongues, that wasn't of God. You spent hours praying in the Holy Ghost meetings in tongues. I, it shocks me. You have to protect your heart because 
out of it flow the issues of life that the Holy Spirit will lead you. So them that are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. And the five things that hinder from being led by the Spirit, number one way in summarizing tonight, grieving the Holy Spirit. Number two, quenching the fire, quenching the Holy Spirit. Number three, resisting the Holy Spirit. Number four, lying to the Holy Spirit. And then the fifth and the final is blaspheming the Holy Spirit. I've seen a lot of things. I've seen a lot of things. I've seen all five of these operate in people's lives. You do this long enough, you kind of see it all. You've got to protect your heart. You've got to protect the peace of God because that's how God will lead you. If you lose your peace, you lose your joy, that's a sign to you something's not right. You got to check your heart and you got to look inward instead of looking outward. Most people will tend to look outward and blame somebody else, but you got to look at yourself. Why have I lost my peace and my joy? What's happened? What, what, what have I allowed in my heart? Because then you'll be misled. You will be led, but misled. It won't be the Holy Spirit leading you, but it'll be another spirit. Spirit of offense can lead you. Spirit of deception could lead you. A religious spirit can come. Think about it. When Saul lost the Holy Spirit and another spirit came, one of the greatest men of God of the previous century was a man named, a great man of God, a great prophet, one of the healing evangelists of the voice of William Brenham. Was, they say that he was the most powerful of them all. But at the end of his days, he thought he, he was Elijah come back. He thought he was Elijah. And he used to have an angel come, stand on the pulpit, on the stage and give him words of knowledge and point people out and call them out. But over time, he got to a point where the angel had left and another spirit had come in and he was not able to tell the difference. And that spirit began to give him false doctrine. And he began to teach doctrines of devils. And God had to take him out. He died in a head-on collision. Because of the position he had with the body of Christ, he would have caused such great damage. And he did. He caused great damage. He died in a head-on collision. That's not a, a way for a great minister to die, is it? What happened? God removed his hedge of protection and allowed him to be killed in an accident so that he could be out of the way. God didn't kill him, but that's basically what happened. And a lot of the leaven of his teaching made its way into the charismatic movement in the late 80, 70s and 80s and became a lot of the, you know, part of what was coming out of the prophetic movement out of Kansas City. It's what they call the Kansas City prophets. I've researched and studied everything, all of it. Terrible things have been introduced and come into the, what's so-called the prophetic movement became so defiled. So you have to understand the leaven. That's why Jesus warned about the leaven of the Pharisees. A little tiny little bit of leaven will spoil the whole batch. False doctrine. I've heard Dr. Ryan used to say this, and when I was in Bible school, he would always say this, but, and then I didn't understand. And years later, I, I, he said, you can bring people back from almost any sin. He goes, but... False doctrine, it's very hard to bring people back from. Once they've become self-deceived in false doctrine, you almost cannot bring them back. So, but that's not something that happens overnight. And the progression of those five steps, so you never want to get into step one. As soon as you grieve the Holy Ghost, you've got to immediately deal with it. Figure out what it is and get it out of your life. Get it out of your heart immediately. ASAP. Because you don't want to go in that progression 
where now you can't be led by the Holy Spirit. You will be led, right? You will be led. You'll be led to a golden calf. You won't give to the temple, but you'll end up giving to the golden calf. You'll give somewhere. There's always a price of a decision. And the price of serving God and making the right decision is always the blessing and the God rewarding you. But the price on the other side is terrible. David made a decision one day not to go to war, King David. And the progressive decisions he made afterwards and the peace never the strife never left his house. Study out what happened to his kids and to Absalom and everything. I mean, just, it's terrible. But there is, decisions have a cost attached to it. That's why it's so important to let, make the right decision and never rush into the wrong decision. To make sure that you are being led by the Spirit and if you are unclear, then you need to surround yourself with godly people and be undercover and, and submitted to leadership that can let at the mouth of two or three witnesses every word be established. Accountability. But we're living in a generation where people don't want to be accountable. We're living in a society where there's no accountability. Oh, you don't like me? I'll just go to the other church. Oh, I don't like what you said. I'll go to the other church. Okay. Whatever floats your boat, no skin off my back. I'm going to keep doing what God's told me to do. So be led by the Spirit. I'm going to continue on this, and then I'll bring some other good stuff on how to actually know that it's the peace of God not emotion and um but the peace of god the inner witness is the number one way god's going to speak to you it's not going to be a voice voice like a sentence god speaking the audible voice is something rare it can and does happen but it doesn't happen every day it might happen once in a lifetime once a year maybe in the life of a christian you can count it on one or two hands, but every single day will be the peace of God. That's why grieving the Holy Spirit is the number one way that you'll begin to be led out of the leading of the Holy Spirit. That's why you never want to get to that. If you, have, if you know that you've grieved the Spirit of God, you've got to deal with it ASAP, 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 immediately. Nip it in the bud. Don't allow it to take root and bear fruit in your life. Amen? Amen. 